Uh, thank you, Professor, for um, uh, having this interview with me today. You are a pioneer in South Africa and a very, very important person uh, in, in the arena of heart surgery in South Africa. And you worked with Professor Chris Barnard. Well, uh, you know, I didn't actually work in his unit, but mm. um, I was uh, the professor of cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Advertisrand when he was my counterpart in Cape Town. Mm. And uh, we had, to some extent, I suppose, competing units. Uh, we had a massive unit in Johannesburg, and we uh, performed almost 2,000 open heart operations a year. Mm. which had made it one of the biggest units uh, in the world. Mm. So, you know, I've always had great respect for Chris Barnard. I thought his achievements were absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we frequently communicated. Uh, he badly wanted me to do transplants uh, in Johannesburg because of our massive turnover. But, um, you know, I th always thought that uh, I could operate on 10 children for the same amount of work and effort as one transplant. Mm. So we had a friendly agreement mm. that he would do the transplants and we would promote the operations of children uh, in Johannesburg. So we never kept a waiting list then. You know, we, as patients required surgery, so they were done. And if we had to do four or five patients a day, that's how it was done. Uh, we didn't work in one hospital. We worked at Baraguanath, where we did about eight or nine hundred a year, and what was then called the J.G. Strader Hospital, where we did over a thousand patients a year. So in those two hospitals, we managed to perform almost two thousand a year. Now, the reason I didn't keep a waiting list is I've always thought that a waiting list is a death list, because uh, while you're waiting, you inevitably die. And if you need open heart surgery as a neonate or infant, uh, it needs to be done soon. Now, you know, most neonates, and this is where the return, I think, is greatest, they need surgery soon. They need surgery in the first month or two of life. And if they have surgery in that first month or two of life, they can live 70 years. That's the extraordinary fact, you know, that. Uh, just by operating early, you can save a life for a normal lifespan. Now let's talk about baby Holly. I saw her yesterday and I have to tell you, I'm, I, was, I felt her chest and I, I wanted to cry because she couldn't even breathe with the ABSD that she has, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there's two mm -hmm. holes in her heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said to me that, um, the mother said to me that, um, Rob Zan, that there's a waiting list for 400, mm -hmm. 400 year where we are mm -hmm. um, in Natal. And I asked her, what about the Red Cross? She said, there's also a waiting list. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right, uh, this baby has two big holes in the heart mm -hmm. and as a result of that there's excessive blood flow and excessive pressure in the arteries to the lungs. Now we know that uh, beyond the age of uh, four to six months those arteries to the lungs become irreversibly damaged and then it doesn't help to operate mm -hmm. because the child doesn't have normal lungs. So it's uh, imperative that you operate before, at the very latest, six months. Beyond six months, the arteries are so badly damaged that they never recover. So it's no use having a normal heart and no lungs. So that's why surgery is essential within the first six months of life. But, you know, as I said earlier, I really do believe that waiting lists in children neonates and infants with congenital heart disease is just unthinkable because these patients die waiting or if they don't die their lungs become irreversibly damaged and they're going to die subsequently so waiting lists in, in my view is an absolute no-no it, it shouldn't happen in children with congenital heart disease uh, Professor tell me why do you think there is such a 
long waiting list? Well, I think there's just not enough capacity. Now, I've always held the view that um, you shouldn't keep a waiting list. And it's for that reason and that when I was in Johannesburg, we never kept a waiting list, but we did 2,000 open hearts a year. Mm -hmm. And, um, but fortunately we had the capacity and at that time uh, it was a state hospital, a university state hospital, they provided us with the facilities to do all these operations. Currently uh, that is not the case and I don't think that uh, pediatric cardiac surgeries, sadly, is a government priority. It's just not a priority. They have other things that they are priorities. And congenital heart disease is not a uh, priority. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, there's been an unbelievable development in pediatric cardiac surgery. When I started pediatric cardiac surgery more than 50 years ago, um, not many procedures could actually be performed. Now we can confident, confidently say that virtually every single congenital heart defect can be corrected or at least very well palliated, um, which was not the case uh, 50 years ago. But now we can correct them all. And I think that um, you know, the, we just haven't kept pace with this unbelievable development in pediatric cardiac surgery. Now there are so many patients waiting. I mean, you can imagine what the situation is like in Africa. In Africa, there's hardly any cardiac surgery is performed, certainly not in neonates and infants. And you know, for that reason, when I, I gave a lecture many a few years ago to the World Society in Istanbul in Turkey, and I called the situation in Africa continental genocide. I saw and, that. And you know, it's tough. It's you know, tough words, but it's, it is true. And the incidence of um, heart disease in children, not only congenital but also rheumatic, mm. uh, the continent is full of rheumatic heart disease. It's it's equal or greater than that of uh, HIV. I heard. I, I saw so, that too. So you know, it's mm. a it's a real problem, but it is mm. just simply not a priority. And we have to get governments to understand that surgery for children with heart disease is, should be a priority. It is curative. It is not something which you operate on and the patient passes away a, a few years later. It is absolutely curative. And I have patients, many patients, operated on as neonates who now come back to me and see me 30, 40 years later with their own children. So that is the curative nature of um, pediatric cardiac surgery. And you cannot, to me, as I say, it's unthinkable mm -hmm. that these children should be allowed to demise and pass away mm -hmm. when they can have a corrective, curative operation once and. Yeah. Uh, Professor, there's nothing, another thing that I want to ask you. I love money myself. But if you're rich, you can be saved. If I was a rich baby, rich parents, I wouldn't have had this problem. <laughs> what would you say about that? Well, certainly, uh, um, you know, my view is that every child born in this world who has a cardiac defect should have corrective cardiac surgery should they require it regardless of your economic circumstances. Sadly, that is, is not the case. Uh, you know, it depends on whether you can afford it. Now, certainly in other countries, like Western countries, like the United States and Europe, for example, no child is denied surgery should they require it. Uh, they all have surgery. It's only in the low-income uh, countries where this situation prevails. And certainly, as I say, I think uh, we've got to start somewhere, but we've got to start somewhere to do something about this massive uh, number of children with heart disease who are now being denied treatment. How much does it cost to do this kind of surgery? Well, um, you know, perhaps like our president, I'm a dreamer. 
And uh, as he said, we've all got to lend a hand. Now, if we all lend a hand, then I think we can reduce the cost substantially of these operations. Uh, but uh, the average cost of an operation, and we have to pay for disposables, we have to pay for, someone's got to pay the nurses, someone's got to pay the staff. The average cost of, a, of an operation, depending on its complexity, uh, and there's a big range, but I'd say the average cost is between 150 and 200,000 rand. If one does a very complex ops, operations, now neonates tend to be complex, you're talking now about uh, 300,000 plus for a neonate with a complex congenital heart defect. But if you think about it, you know, two to 300,000 rand for a lifetime, for a lifetime of 70 years, it really pales into insignificance. But we must all lend a hand. And I'm at a stage of my life where, you know, I, I want to put something back. Uh, my patients have been incredible to me. You know, I've learned so much from my patients. You know, we, we always seem to, people seem to think what the surgeon did for the patient. But I think you've got to put that the other way around. It's what the patient's done for the surgeons. And it's our patients that have taught us. That our patients have taught us how to correct these anomalies. And, you know, I can think of many children where we, we haven't been successful where we've actually gone back to the drawing board and said, no, this does not work. We've got to do something different. Uh, and I'm always in you know, great admiration for the countless parents who have actually, in a way, allowed us to operate on their patients. They realize the risk involved. But against that, they also realize that the greatest risk is not taking any risk at all. So during the evolution of pediatric cardiac surgery, which as I say has taken place over the last 50 to 60 years, parents took great risks, surgeons took great risks, but now because of those risks that have been taken, these operations have become everyday successful procedures. But someone had to take that risk. And I have learned so much from my uh, patients whose parents allowed me to operate on, on their children. You know, and I can recall you know, the, the many parents taking their children to that red line you know, in the operating room. They hand their baby across to the theatre staff. And you know, there's like a sacred trust between the theatre staff and the parents. Uh, and you have to do your best for, for that particular child. But I certainly am very, feel a great sense of gratitude to the countless uh, parents and children who've allowed me and the whole discipline to evolve by operating on their children. Fortunately, most often we've been successful, but we're not. Um, we've had to do something, and uh, we've learnt uh, through, these, through these patients. Is it, well, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a problem. I heard that a Down syndrome baby, uh, they moved the Down syndrome baby down the list. Is that so? Mm. Yeah, th that does happen. Mm. But what uh, people don't realize is that in a child with Down syndrome and a defect like this child has, they have repeated admissions to hospital uh, until they eventually pass away. Mm. Now, I can assure you that those repeated admissions to the hospital cost a lot more than a single operation. So if you have an operation on a child in the first six months of life, they, don't, they aren't admitted to hospital every few months to treat a pneumonia, to treat this, to treat that. And they can live a pretty good life, bearing in mind, of course, they, they do have Down syndrome. But um, certainly the cost of not operating is greater than the cost of an operation. Now, now we come to the point uh, where we, uh, I have to ask this question. How do you help a baby, baby Holly? How are we going to help baby Holly? What is the strategy that we have to do now? You know, uh, Professor, uh, the country is in a, in a big uh, predicament at the moment. Because if Mr. Zuma, 
didn't steal all this money, this millions and millions, there would be, there were, they, they will not be a waiting list for the children like we have at the moment. And we are talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of babies dying because it's not even in PE a cath lab. It is totally, totally unacceptable mm. that this waiting list mm. must exist in this country. Mm. Mm. And they just don't have the money. Mm. And mm. because they don't have the money, the baby must mm. die. No, I'm mm. not going, we mm. can't do this. We mm. need mm. something more um, important than that. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a, an extremely difficult situation. Mm. Mm. Because, as you say, there are so many thousands of children throughout mm. this country, never mind Africa, mm. where there are millions mm. who require this sort of surgery. Mm. And, you know, um, pediatric cardiac surgery is so emotive. Mm. You know, and when you have children like this, to see a child dying of a correctable congenital heart defect just because they don't have the funds. Mm. As I say, it's an unthinkable situation, but it happens. And, you know, one of the greatest difficulties, which mm. uh, I find, is this sort of playing God syndrome. You know, why this child? Why not the other 5,000 that are lying around? And that's a situation which we have to face. But, you know, we've, we've got to start somewhere. We've got to rectify this situation. Uh, and the only way to rectify it is to drastically in increase capacity. We, we have to increase the capacity. As I've said, I do not believe that we should keep a waiting list for children with heart disease because it's curative. How can you keep a waiting list? It just doesn't make sense to me. It is what I call continental genocide. You cannot keep a waiting list. We know that we can correct these children and it's sad, it's really sad that you have to make a decision for one patient when you know there's another thousand or more also waiting. But once one gets involved with a child, you know, there's a great emotional attachment to that child. And I can understand it. Um, and it's, it's devastating for me, for example, when I see a child that I want to operate on and they say you can't because there's no money. It's devastating. And I don't like to be in that situation, to be honest. I hate to be in that uh, situation. But I understand that, you know, uh, someone's got to pay for it. Um, hospitals can't run at a loss. Businesses can't run at a loss. You, you know, they, they are shareholders and they can't run at a loss. So, so long as they are. Uh, philanthropic and they're not making obscene profits, uh, we, we, we must cover the cost. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, we just have to find the money, we have to make the capacity to operate on all these children. I think we, we must do something and I think we can uh, uh, we must just. Yeah. I know you've got. I know exactly where we are now. It's. I, I know mm. exactly. Uh, but but mm. uh, I'm going to think mm. very creative about mm. the whole thing. Mm. Uh, I think this yeah. creative thinking mm. must going into sure. this. You know what I mean. Yeah. But maybe I could give you an example yeah, of. Um, you know, when the when we started the foundation, uh, we invited a, a young girl uh, from the UK to come to. Uh, the opening of the foundation. Now her story I think graphically demonstrates what has been lost. She was born in Durban uh, in 1982 and she had a congenital heart defect. Uh, back in 1982 um, the, the, the unit in Durban was not doing many uh, congenital heart defects and she had quite a complex congenital heart defect. So they told her in Durban that she couldn't have surgery and they must really be prepared for her to, to die. In anyway, fact, her mother was very persistent. She came up to Johannesburg. Uh, I'd been trained at the Mayo Clinic in America 
And so I was at the forefront of uh, congenital heart surgery. Now I had, uh, so she came up to Johannesburg and my counterpart in pediatric cardiology told me what she had. And she said, do you think you can do something for this? And I said, well, look, I've never done it. Uh, I, I don't think it's been done in the world before. Uh, if it has, it's, it's not been reported. But I'm sure that we can correct this defect. And it was during this period of evolution of pediatric cardiac surgery. So we operated on her when she was three months um, of age. And uh, we repaired uh, the defect. I told the mother before the operation, I said, look, I, I've never done this before. I'm not sure it has been done before, but I'm sure that we can do something. So we operated on her and she survived and she did extremely well. She subsequently, they immigrated to the UK. She went to medical school. Uh, she became a doctor. Uh, I went to her wedding. Mm, uh, she amazing. married an obstetrician. Uh, she had two, she had two children. Uh, she brought her children out to Durban when she came to this meeting. And the, the amazing thing is she is now a specialist, pediatric cardiac anaesthetist at Harefield in London. Now that's mm. what it can do. That story tells you everything. This is what you're throwing away. Mm. when you don't operate on children like this. Now, as I say, the only reason now that operation, because her parents had this sacred trust in me and said, yes, do it, because they knew what the alternative was. This operation is now commonplace. We do this operation with zero mortality because we now know how to do it. We've fine-tuned it a bit. We've done a bit of this and a bit of that. But now it's done all around the world. Everyone knows how to do it, and we can correct these children. Mm -hmm. But back in 82, it was a big deal. You know, we weren't sure how to correct it. Mm -hmm. But that's her story, and she, I think, epitomizes this gross wastage of good life. Well, thank you very much.